If you have a Bible, I encourage you to, to open it to Ephesians chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible, you can find it in the pew in front of you, and uh, you can find it on page 917 of the Pew Bibles. This morning, we're going to look at a passage that is bookmarked by the word walk, because Paul is going to draw out how we used to walk, or in the things we once walked, and then looking to now the things we should be walking in. So we want to look this morning and ask ourselves, what happened? What occurred to cause this type of, of change and transformation that would stop us from walking this way and, and, and not just make us, but change our very desires that we yearn to walk in this way? So we come to our text from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived, in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Why do we Christians love grace? Why do we sing songs about grace? Why do we name some of our children grace? Why are we about grace? Today, that's what we're going to look at as we see that it is by grace that we cease from walking in these ways in our sin and trespasses and then instead walk in these ways in the works that God has prepared beforehand. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Because apart from grace, we would still be dead in our trespasses. Let us come again and again before you, pleading for grace. You have promised to satisfy our needs. You have promised to give us what we require, and you do it through grace because it is not something we deserve. It's not something we earn. It's unmerited favor towards us, ones who were not just fleeing from you, but were actually enemies. But in love, you chose to save. In love, you chose to bring in enemies and make them sons and daughters. In love, you have promised us a glorious inheritance. And so, Lord, I pray this morning that we would hear your word as you remind us of a great treasure that we have when we have you. Because when we have you, we have the very grace of God. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul begins this section with a dark reality for, for all people. It's, it's, it's kind of like Paul is, is trying to be a jeweler here. If you've gone to a jeweler and you're looking at a ring or, or necklace, often what they will do is they will lay out some dark velvet. Because when you see the dark velvet, it contrasts, it makes more beautiful 
more glorious. It, it shows the, the, the manifold radiance of that ring or that stone or that pendant that they laid down on that velvet. And so what Paul is doing this morning is he is laying out the velvet so that we can see rightly the jewel of the grace of God when it's laid upon that. So we begin with this reality. Apart from the grace of God, you were dead. You were dead in your trespasses, in the sin in which you once walked. All of humanity struggles with this reality because more often than not, we think, well, maybe some of those people out there are lost and dead in their sin, or lost or dead in their trespasses, but not us, because we forget the reality. If you will, all of us are covered in the the soot of the coal mine, and we look around at the other coal miners and we think, well, we're not as dirty as that person. We're We're not as bad as that person, but the reality is you are both in the pit, both covered in dirt, You're both found in the same place. And this is what Paul is is trying to drive home in the text that we're looking at this morning. Paul is inspired by the Holy Spirit to write these words. And, And my hope is as we look at these verses, you will see the depraved state that you find yourself in when you are apart from God. And there's consequences. Paul is seeking to break us of our selfish pride. He's seeking to humble us so that we have nothing to boast in. And this is why the first three verses, I mean, Paul is, is laying it on there so that we would see again and again and again the reality of where we find ourselves We once walked in this way. These verses, verse 1 through 3, tell us you followed the course of the world. You were were influenced or directed by Satan, which he writes as the prince of the power of the air. And it's not just the world out there and the culture you live in. It's not just Satan, but, but, but you are under the control of your own flesh, your sinful human broken desires. You might call these things the triple tyrannies, or the triple tyrants that, that are in our life and they, they direct us to do these things or to live that way. You followed the course of the world. We often don't even see it. Because we were born into this world, we were born into this culture, we were born into this form or ways or means of doing things, and it is so normal that we don't even see it anymore. We're also under that second tyrant, the the tyrant of Satan, which Paul, like I said, he calls it ruler or, or prince of the air. Paul's using a a Jewish imagery from that time where you have the heavens where where God reigns and then you have the physical realm and and they would often talk about the prince of the air, Satan living in this spiritual realm, not not quite in heaven, but but also not fully physical, but in this realm. And he's saying, you're you're under that authority. Paul isn't saying that you're a puppet to Satan. But, he, but he's implying that you are deceived, you are directed, you are you're kind of guided by, by these temptations or by these deceptions to, to live in a way because more often than not, we act and behave more like sons of Satan than sons of God. Perhaps you remember when Jesus is having a a confrontation with some of the Pharisees. And he says, you're liars, just like your father. Speaking of the father of lies, Satan. The final tyrant that we find ourselves under is our own flesh. We follow sinful desires. 
Paul, in his letter to the Romans, chapter 8, verses 7 and 8, he says this, The mind set on the flesh is hostile towards God, for it does not subjugate itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. If you're living for yourself, you can't please God. Why? Well, because you can't, you can't serve two masters. You can't serve yourself as master. You can't serve God as master because one has to win out. And in, in our lost brokenness, in that sin, it's usually ourselves that win. It's, it's ingrained in us. No one teaches the small child to always pick the bigger half when you cut that brownie. No one teaches you to just naturally put yourself in a better position, whether it's stealing money from the Monopoly bank when your parents look away, or at work, you're just trying to Put yourself, making sure you're always friendly to the boss to get the promotion. It's, it's here. It's rooted in here. And we fight to control it. These influences, these triple tyrants enslave us. They, they chain us and they, they bind us. They, they promise us that there will be joy. They promise us there will be life. They, they promise us the desires of our hearts. But when we get there, we find they're not there. And instead, we are now enslaved because we think the next thing is going to give it to us. And the next thing and they, they choke us. They're, they're like heavy chains wrapped around us as we are trying to, to tread water to keep our heads above. And instead, they just keep pulling us down and down and down. And because of this, because of the state we find ourselves in, Paul calls us children of wrath. Because that's, that's the, the right consequence for that, that sinful life that we live in. He's not speaking in hyperbole. Paul's not exaggerating. You are worse than you could ever imagine. Paul is, is making sure we, we, we all have no leg to stand on by addressing everything. And this state that we walk in this sin nature we find ourselves in is fatal. There is a tragic consequence, and it's death, an eternal death. Always dying, but never dead. The scriptures are consistent. They say over and over and over again, you will not die from sin. You are dead in sin. We are the living dead. We are zombies. We're just not smart enough to even eat brains. We just eat whatever brings us delight. Food, entertainment, Sex, drugs, rock and roll. That's what we try to live off of. The writer of Hebrews says these terrifying words. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of a living God. It's a terrifying thing. And, and, and again, I'm just trying to set us. I'm just trying to lay out the black velvet here. It's a terrifying thing. The problem is, is 
for many of us here, we, we understand this, but, but we live in a world that, that treats God like he's everyone's buddy and they don't realize it's a terrifying thing to find yourself in the hands of a living, a living God. Because his hands are not made of stone or carved of wood, they can do something. And so Paul lays out the crushed velvet to remind us that God is a loving God, but he is also a just God. And if he is loving, he has to be just. So while the world will praise the love of God, they often forget the other attributes of God. He is loving He is kind. He is slow to anger. Note that the verse does not say he does not get angry. He's just slow to it. The state of being dead in our sins, being lost in our trespasses, means we can't fix ourselves. Dead people don't do anything. They're dead. And what needs to be changed is is inside of us. And and while you might, I don't know, I I, I bet to ask Stephen this or some of his uh, medical background. While you might be able to remove your own appendix, I wouldn't recommend it. But while you might be able to actually do that, you cannot do a heart transplant. Somebody outside of you needs to reach their hands inside of you Take out that heart that's dying, that's dead, and give you a new heart. You need someone outside of you to be gracious, to help you. And this is the the, the velvet that's laid out, but it's not the end. The, the, The hope of this sermon isn't that you walk out and say, man, I am just dead. There's no hope. Everything's just Blackness. Paul continues. What changes humanity? What brings those who are dead to life? I came across the story, perhaps you're familiar with George Whitfield. He was an evangelist during the Great Awakening of in America in the 1700s. He was known for having a powerful voice. Imagine no PA system, and he would preach before 10,000 people using his own voice. And there's this story where there was this gentleman who heard that he was going to come through their town and, and preach the gospel. And so him and a couple others gathered some rocks, stuffed them in their pockets, and they went to the service. And their hope was that they would then take these rocks and pelt Whitfield with them while he was preaching. George Whitfield gets up there, he preaches the gospel, and at the end of the sermon, one of these gentlemen comes forward, empties his pockets of the rocks, and he says these words to Whitfield, I came to hear you with my pockets full of stones to break your head. But your sermon got the better of me and broke my heart. There was something preached in that sermon that that changed this man who was ready to just throw stones. That broke his soul, his heart, changed him. What brings the dead to light? What is the power that has the ability to radically transform people. What is mighty enough to break the chains of the bondage that the the triple tyrannies put upon our lives? Well, if we look here at verses 4 through 9, we see that. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, read, even when you didn't deserve it, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him. You should be reading, by grace you have been saved. By grace you have been raised up. By grace you are seated with him in the heavenly places. By grace 
so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God. Not that a, a result of works so that no one may boast. What changes us? Christian, by grace, grace changes you. By the grace of God, you are made alive. Not by works. Not by being good enough. By grace. This is why we sing songs. This is why we call our daughters grace. This is why we praise it. This is why when we see God's grace working out in the lives of other people, we want to worship Him. Because look at what He just did there. Did you see that? And, and I think we forget the grace of God After laying out the black velvet, we read, but God. Two English words, when laid together, are the most glorious words. But God. You were dead in your sin and trespasses. You were were following after the way of the world. You were under the control of the prince of the power of the air. You were were in submission to the, the, the sinful, evil desires of your heart. But God, out of his love and mercy for you, unlovable ones, that's gracious. He made us alive with Christ. If you look here at verse 5, we read, even when you were dead in your trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ That's the main thrust of this section. That's the main point. It's the pivot. Here's where you were. But God made you alive. So now you're here. Different. Changed. Transformed. It is by grace you have been raised up. Christian, it is not that you are a better person or that you have done some religious actions that satisfied or put God in Your debt. There is nothing you can do to put God in your debt. It is all by grace. The Christian faith is not about becoming a kinder person, a gentler person. It is about becoming a new person. You don't become new apart from the grace of God. It's grace. It's a merited favor. Or, or uh, how, how is it put now? It's, it's in my head, and now I can't remember it. Brothers and sisters, you were made alive, which means you were dead before. It's, it's, it's pictures. It's as if you were like Lazarus. Your body is dead and decaying in the tomb. And God says, fill in your name, come forth. You were dead, but now you're alive. You don't need to be resuscitated. You need resurrection. We sometimes look at our lives and what we do is we we take a little bit of Jesus and we try to fix just this one little part. But the grace of God wants to blow out the walls that we try to block them up into. The grace of God wants to change you radically. The world should look at our lives and say, what just happened? When the grace of God is working in us. Friends, do you see the glory of, of, of the grace of God, the, this, the manifold radiance of it when you lay it against that black velvet of your sinful life. You, you should be able to look back at your life and say, okay, here's where I was, and, and I see that. But, and then it was just like, boom, everything changed. I'm not saying you're not going to still struggle with sin. 
But what I'm saying is you've seen the power of the grace of God. So when you do struggle with sin, you don't say, I got this, Jesus. You go again to God for more of the grace. I need more grace. I I see where I'm still fighting sin here. I see where my desires still want to lead you. I I mean, I love that, that line in the hymn, prone to wander. Lord, I need it. What? Grace. I need you. Because I know I I, want to go there, and, and I need more of you to change me bit by bit by bit by bit until that one day when I will be glorified. The grace of God is more powerful than you could fathom. It has the ability to break the chains of those tyrants that rule over our lives. God brings the dead to life. It's not some sort of transactional agreement where God comes to the table with grace and then you come to the table with faith. And you shake hands and part ways. That's not what you see here in, in verse 8. We read, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Grace is a gift. You can't demand it. But you can plead for it. You can ask for it. God has already promised that He will supply all of our needs. It's all grace. Grace. God's righteousness at Christ's expense. Grace. You get the righteousness of God through the death of Christ. Because you were a child of wrath. You deserve the punishment. You deserve the justice of God to be poured out upon you. But instead, Christ took that. And so those of us who would believe come aligned with Christ. And so now when God looks at us, He views us very graciously because He views us as Christ. As in Christ. How generous, how costly grace is. Beloved, you are saved by grace. In the Greek, that's, that's a present tense, not present, that's actually a perfect tense, meaning you were saved by grace, you're being saved by grace, and you will be saved by grace. He's got you all the way through. There's nothing for us to boast in. Grace removes all grounds of boasting. And so we just say with Paul, I have nothing to boast in but Christ and Him crucified. Why? Because it's through that death and resurrection that grace comes to me. So I boast, but I'll boast only in Christ. I won't boast in my ability. Paul writes to the the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, What do you have that you did not receive? Have you ever thought about that? James, the brother of Jesus, says, every good gift comes from the Father of lights. What do you have that you did not receive? Life, gift. Talents, gifts. Your finances, gifts. What do you have that you did not receive? It should be humbling. But there's also this glorious truth in in, in verse 7 that that should encourage us in this gracious salvation that is ours in Christ. We have been saved. Why? So that God might pour out this from this eternal torrent, if you will, Grace upon grace upon grace upon you. That, that, I can't wrap my mind around that. It just doesn't, doesn't make sense. When, 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 when you're impacted and changed by the grace of God, you don't walk around saying, well, of course God gave it to me. 
And then if, if anything, you're humbled even more. And, and you say, why me? Why would you do this? And he says, because I am a good and gracious father. And we return that grace with praise and we exalt his name forever and ever. Listen, th- this is the part that I think sometimes the world often forgets, but I think even Christians do. We shouldn't be awed at God's justice and, and punishment, the consequences that he'll pour out upon sin. We shouldn't be awed by that because that's right. The thing we should be awed by is the fact that that just holy God would give grace to us. That's the amazing part of the gospel. You know, people don't like to talk about hell because we're uncomfortable with that. But of course we get grace. We love that part. The reality is, what, what, what Paul has laid out in those first verses, you deserve this. That shouldn't be shocking. Were you ever a kid like me, and you did something wrong, and you knew it was wrong? Were you shocked when the punishment came, when your parents found out? You weren't like, I don't know why my dad would spank me right now. You weren't shocked by that because you knew that that that, that was the consequence. You might be shocked when dad showed mercy, right? Like you deserve something. Mercy is saying, I'm not going to give you what you deserve. But you would be overwhelmed if that parent showed you grace. Didn't just hold back what you deserved, but gave you what you didn't deserve, didn't deserve. That's grace. That's that's amazing. God could have just, well, okay, punishment, I'll hold that back. But instead, he gives himself. The greatest grace is, is himself. He gives himself to us again and again. Church, we should be delighted. We should be singing songs of praise because he has taken us from this way that we once walked in to this new life, to, to walk in a new way in his grace and for a purpose. Take a look here at verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for the good works which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Beloved, we are made alive to the glory of God. You're not made alive so you can just keep living for yourself. You've been made alive to to live for the glory. In case there's anyone here this morning who maybe missed this point from verses 4 and 9, let me state this clearly. No person can earn their salvation through works. No person is saved by works. No person can earn or merit it. There is absolutely nothing you can do to put God in your debt and make Him give you salvation. While works do not save, Christian, works should be manifest in your life. I've heard a pastor phrase it this way. Works are not the root of salvation, but the fruit of it. They don't save you, but if you're saved, you should live in a way that looks like you're saved, and that would be fruit, that would be the works, that would be the things that we do, that would be walking in the way that you have now been placed in. Other Christians have put it this way, it is faith alone that justifies, but faith that justifies can never be alone. You've probably experienced this. I know as a pastor I have where where you interact with people and they say they are Christians, but you look at their lives and there's nothing that shows 
Christ-exalting work. Paul is saying something beautiful here when he says, for we are his workmanship. The, the Greek word there is often used to describe artists creating things, like a sculptor or a painter or even a, you know, a lyricist writing poems. He doesn't mean it like we might when we're talking about Genesis 1, how God has created all people in the image of God. He is saying, you are being recreated as, as a piece of art to display the, the glory of God wherever you go and, and, and through whatever you do, that you would live in a way that does that. Jesus himself in Matthew 5 tells us, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever lived consistently in a way that, that someone says, why do you do that? Or have you ever functioned and, and, and done something in, in such a way that the people praise God? I, I've, I've experienced it. it. It's kind of weird because these people I know who don't really believe in God will see this gracious act. You know, like some of you have experienced this. Maybe you've helped with like a care portal delivery where we brought over, you know, these things, these people. And... And what do they say? Praise God. Why? Because of the, the gracious generosity of the work that you're doing in a way shows you're living for God, not for yourself. That, that's what stirs praise. Our salvation has a purpose, a purpose that was prepared beforehand. You are saved for a reason. To work. And that's when everybody says amen, right? Like, because we love work. But if you're working in a way that brings glory to God, wouldn't you love it? Wouldn't you, wouldn't, wouldn't you face it differently? The new humanity that, that God has graciously given us makes us no longer walk in the way that the world walks, no longer influenced from, from the deception and the lies. It walks in the spirit instead of the flesh. Beloved, you don't do ministry and you don't walk in ways and holiness to save yourselves. You do it because it honors God. We were made alive by the grace of God to walk in it that we would glorify and proclaim His name above all names, declaring that He alone is worthy. And because we have seen the grace of God work in our lives in, a, in amazing ways, we want more grace so that we can work better for His glory. Here's the, here's the caution, though, because I, I think sometimes as Christians, we read this text and we say, okay, but then we get so caught up with trying to find, well, what is that job? What's that, what's that thing, that, that action that God has prepared beforehand for me to do in a way that, that declares his glory? And we, we're looking constantly out there. But we forget where God has placed us right here, right now. Some of you are forgetting and ignoring or diminishing the ordinary. We think some great work, and maybe we think of a missionary or, or an evangelist or, or somebody like that, and we forget the ordinary everyday life that God has placed us in. Perhaps that great work is to show love and mercy and forgiveness to that spouse that sometimes is hard to live with. Perhaps that great work is waking up every morning and discipling the children God has placed in your home. Or being kind to the difficult coworker, Or saying the hard things in a relationship all of these are works in which we can walk 
and the grace of God in a way that would bring glory and honor to him. Don't, don't just look at the big ways God can work or use you. Look at the small ways. He who is faithful in little things will be faithful in great things. If you take a look at verse 10, if you have a Bible, I would just encourage you to, to, to look at it one more time. And as you're looking at it, I want you to think of what is the most boring, mundane task that you have to do on a regular basis? What is the most boring, mundane And then read this. For you are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that you may walk in them. Wouldn't that transform the way you did that? I don't know if it changes because I'm a dad now, but when I was a teenager, I hated mowing the lawn, it was boring. We had a big hill in our backyard, so, you know, you're just the entire time walking sideways and then turn and walk sideways, and, you know, I hated it. But if I actually viewed it like, this is a work that has been prepared beforehand, how can I mow the lawn to the glory of God? All right, now as a dad, I enjoy mowing the lawn. Why? What gets me away from everyone else? No. My wife just joked around with the kids just the other day because one of my sons was mowing the lawn and his brother was trying to call him out and he couldn't hear him. And she said, you know how many times I called your dad and realized he can't hear me because of the mower? And then I realized, well, he also can't hear me because he has his earphones in, you know. Why? Well, because I'm enjoying it. And the fact of the matter is, the mundane ins and outs of being a dad should be just as joyful if I'm doing it with the grace of God and walking in the ways of righteousness that he's put me in. The most mundane thing could be done for the glory of God. Sometimes we think so big and we forget what God has placed right in front of us. The grace of God that brought you from death to life has brought you to live the life that you have right here, right now. And his grace is sufficient to meet those needs right here, right now, in the big things, in the little things, in the things you're excited for, in the things you dread. In the normal everyday life, you can live in a way that others would say, why is it that you do that? Or that people would walk away praising God because you mowed the lawn? Because you spent 10 minutes talking to a friend at work instead of just rushing out, God has done a mighty thing in you by grace, not because you deserve it, but because God is good. Brothers and sisters, by the grace of God, the, the triple tyrants have been broken. You don't have to live the way the world lives, chasing the endless cycle. You know the truth now, and so you can fight against the deception of the prince of the air. You actually have the ability to overcome your fleshly desires because you live by the Spirit instead of the flesh. He has made you new. Walk in the new life. Put off the sin nature of death and live the life of grace that God has given you. I pray here, don't, don't leave thinking I'm terrible. Leave thinking, have you seen the beauty of the grace of God? I know I've used this example before, but there are women who when a guy gets down on a knee and slides on a piece of pressurized carbon get all giddy, 
And us men are like, I could buy that amount of rock on a drill for cheaper. But what do they do with that gift? You know, why do we see pictures on Facebook with no faces and just a hand on someone's shoulder? I'm like, someone's engaged. I don't know who it is. Why is it that they come to all their friends or to their mom and they're like, why? Because that stone is, is beautiful to them because it's symbolic of, of this relationship and that this, this giving of himself to her. That's what the grace of God is. We should be more giddy than a stupid little rock there. Because you have received something far greater than a diamond and a stone set in a piece of metal that you probably paid way too much for. Because by the grace of God, you have been given everything you could ever need. Ever. His grace is sufficient. The grace that saved you is saving you and will save you. That is the good news of the gospel that Paul lays out here in 10 verses. Let's pray. Lord God, no words can express the gratitude when we realize where we were, what we were living for and walking in and we're saved from all the work of grace. We didn't deserve it. We can't earn it. We can't even pay it back. We're just called to honor you. We're called to worship you. We're called to live in a way that declares the goodness of your glory. Lord, I, I pray that we would see it radiate as it sits against the backdrop of a lost, sinful world. That it would pop off into the eyes of those who maybe are hearing me right now who do not know this grace. Who either think they don't deserve it, who, who maybe think that they don't need it. I pray that you would show them the darkness of the life they live and the gift of the immeasurable grace of God in Christ Jesus. I pray that all of us would come again and again to that fountain. And we would drink. We would dive in and we would be washed by it. And that we would so be transformed by it that we would live in a way that is drastically different from the world, live in a way that declares, God is my treasured portion. God is my hope and joy. God is who I will trust in. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.